Welcome everybody. This is uh, Dr. Pawan Gorukanti. I'm the director of Yashoda Group of Hospitals uh, here in uh, Hyderabad. But uh, basically, my background is a pulmonary critical care doctor. Uh, like I did my pulmonary critical care fellowship from New York and uh, since then uh, relocated to India since the last two or three years and now mostly in the administrative role here. So this uh, last year everybody has gone through COVID pandemic completely changed our lives and uh, like uh, here in Yashoda probably we treated more than uh, 20 or 30,000 people with uh, COVID including the sickest of the sick uh, at the uh, peak of occupancy, we were having about uh, 350 critical care patients or so, almost uh, 160 ventilators running continuously and uh, many of the patients are ECMO, transplants and all kinds of things and uh, particularly all of our pulmonologists here uh, did a yeoman's job, sometimes seeing almost 200 patients per day, that kind of uh, busy. But uh, hopefully now things are uh, settling, at least in Hyderabad, the COVID occupancy has uh, decreased to minimal. and. Uh, uh, we can go back to our uh, bread and butter of uh, pulmonary treatment. So in addition to intervention and uh, all of these other pulmonary procedures which all of you are doing and particularly uh, here uh, we are uh, talking today about uh, the advances of uh, sleep medicine too. Uh, as you know health span and lifespan uh, depends on a few things so like uh, one is uh, diet, calorie restricted, uh, nutritious diet and uh, the second one is exercise but the third and equal uh, component I think is uh, like related to sleep you know people spend about one third of their average time uh, lifespan in sleep and uh, there is a reason uh, uh, we humans spend almost about 33 percent of our time sleeping uh, there are no shortcuts to lack of sleep uh, if if we did not have to waste so much of our time nature would have designed for something else uh, sleep is absolutely important and has magical almost magical restorative properties uh, useful for uh, everything uh, including your uh, driving and all like you know it's actually if uh, even an uh, uh, like alcoholic uh, state is, uh, is actually maybe better than uh, pure insomniac state like uh, sometimes I remember some of these uh, post call days uh, when you did uh, residency like 36 hours working continuously driving was so difficult sometimes I felt uh, like you know like even uh, drunken driving may be better so uh, sleep is extremely important uh, and uh, you know nowadays awareness of uh, sleep and sleep disorders is increasing and uh, uh, you be pulmonologist and all mostly will be involved in this uh, sleep apnea sleep disorders so we have a wonderful team here, uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran uh, here has joined us uh, since the last uh, more than one year now from uh, Saptachang is doing a great job in Malakpet and he got you, a, uh, organized a wonderful set of uh, seminars uh, to go through the basics of uh, sleep disorders, uh, particularly obstructive sleep apnea and we'll have a session on uh, central sleep apnea too. Uh, like uh, being a pulmonologist and all you may be aware of people snoring and all you will be most likely the first point of contact for people with uh, sleep disorders and you can make a big difference in their uh, uh, lifestyle so uh, we request you all to go through these uh, lectures uh, top class lectures from experts from all over the world so uh, and I'm sure you'll uh, be much benefited and you will benefit your patients too and uh, thank you very much. This is Dr. Pawan Gorakanti signing off and Dr. Vishwesharan now will uh, take you through the next uh, steps, uh, basics about uh, sleep. Uh, maybe we'll start with uh, obstructive sleep apnea and uh, go to the more complicated ones and how to diagnose, treat and everything else. Thank you. Good evening friends. Uh, thanks Dr. Pawan for the uh, introduction. So welcome you all for the first edition of the International Scientific Webinar on Sleep Medicine and Update. So in this we have uh, in this session we have uh, two international speakers with us, Professor um, uh, Sharab Jawahari and uh, Professor Danny Eckert, who are the experts in the in their field of uh, management of uh, OSA as well as in central sleep apnea. So myself, uh, Dr. Vishweshwaran uh, Balasubramanian, and I'm currently working as a consultant interventional pulmonology and sleep medicine specialist at Ashoda Hospitals in Hyderabad in India. So OSA is defined as a recurrent episodes of uh, partial or complete collapse of the upper airways during sleep, which results in either a reduced airflow, which we call it as a hypopnea, 
or an absent airflow which we call it as an apnea and that lasts for at least 10 seconds and associated with either a cortical arousal or fall in blood oxygen saturation it may be associated with increased incidence of hypertension type 2 diabetes mellitus atrial fibrillation heart failure coronary artery disease stroke and even death so this is a picture that shows the on the left side that shows the normal anatomy of the airway we have two regions uh, in the normal anatomy of the upper airway that is the retropalatal region and the retroglossal region when we see the upper picture on the right side you see there is a reduction in the uh, diameter of the retropalatal region this may occur because of patients having a an elongated soft palate and whenever there is an increase in the fat accumulation or there is a downward angle of the genioglossus muscle there occurs a decrease in the retroglossal region and this may also contribute to a upper airway obstruction leading to obstructive sleep apnea the other pathophysiological mechanism which may lead to an increased incidence of obstructive sleep apnea are an increase in the fat in the latropharyngeal region so whenever the fat increases on the latropharyngeal region it can constrict both the retroglossal uh, region and the retropalatal region and thereby cause a reduction in the upper airway diameter which may further uh, increase the chances of having a obstructive sleep apnea and in addition to this there are a few anatomical abnormalities like a short mandibular length which decreases the retro um, glossal region which may further increase the incidence of having a obstructive sleep apnea so why is it important uh, and why we are concerned about an obstructive sleep apnea because all this upper airway obstruction secondary to uh, the anatomical defects or because of a um, uh, decrease in the diameters of the retroglossal or the retropalatal region can cause intermittent hypoxemia it can cause sleep fragmentation and it can cause larger intrathoracic pressure stress when it causes all these things it, it the hypoxia may lead to an oxidative stress it can cause an overactivation of your sympathetic nervous system and there is a disruption of your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and there is an increased cardiac preload and afterload all this will lead to increase in blood pressure it will lead to metabolic dysregulation systemic inflammation endothelial dysfunction and myocardial dysfunction so all this may result in having disease end points like increased incidence of hypertension type 2 diabetes mellitus coronary artery disease cerebrovascular disorders arrhythmias and even there is an increase in the risk of developing a heart failure so one of the most common symptoms that patient present to us having an underlying obstructive sleep apnea is the presence of an unrefreshing sleep but however the most reliable indicator for having an underlying obstructive sleep apnea is either a nocturnal gasping or a choking phenomenon but there are other symptoms that which the patient can present to us excessive sleepiness is reported by as high as 90% of patients with obstructive sleep apnea you may start feeling fatigue tired or lack of energy during the daytime because of uh, lack of sleep during the night and snoring though a uh, sensitive marker for having an obstructive sleep apnea is not specific and it may occur in any other process of uh, narrowed upper airway in the form of a uh, nose block or deviated nasal septum and chronic morning headache which occurs at least half of the days is characterized by a bilateral pressure sensation and it results within hours of waking and or of unknown nature so any patient who comes to you and presents to you with unexplained headache may also have an underlying uh, possibility of an obstructive sleep apnea and when we take into the risk factors definitely overweight versus normal weight the patients with overweight has a higher odds ratio of developing an obstructive sleep apnea and even patients who are obese have a very high odds ratio of 4 to 10.5 of developing an obstructive sleep apnea patients who are male and who has got increase in age and there is a 10 year increment of higher risk of developing an obstructive sleep apnea and the patients who are post menopausal are at a higher risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea and even for that matter patients who have anatomical uh abnormalities like enlarged upper airway soft tissue like tonsil adenoid or tongue can have a higher incidence of obstructive sleep apnea patient having craniofacial abnormalities like retrognathia or micrognathia can have higher incidence of developing obstructive sleep apnea and all these factors may present in may present in a particular patient in isolation or there may be multiple factors of this attributing to a increased uh, risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea in a particular patient and uh, the most common prevalent um, symptom are excessive sleepiness fatigue or an unrefreshing sleep 
or presence of snoring in most of the nights also may indicate having a higher prevalence of uh, having an obstructive sleep apnea and witnessed breathing pauses choking or gasping which are very specific of obstructive sleep apnea can be seen in 10 to 15% of patients with os and nocturia that is more than two or more times of uh, maturation during night can be seen in as high as one third of the patients with osa and nocturnal gerd can be present in as high as 50 to 75 percentage of patients having osa and morning headache uh, which seen in almost half of the days of the sleep are seen in as high as 12 to 18 percentage of patients with obstructive sleep apnea and how do we evaluate a patient having an obstructive sleep apnea? The first and the foremost thing is having a high suspicion of obstructive sleep apnea in a patient and reviewing his symptoms of snoring or excessive uh, daytime sleepiness or fatigue or breathing pauses at night. All this history can give an uh, clue that probably you are dealing with a case of an obstructive sleep apnea. In addition to that, we have multiple questionnaires in the form of a Berlin questionnaire or a stop band questionnaire or an Epsilon sleep questionnaire. The Berlin questionnaire consists of three domains, one is snoring or apneas and fatigue or sleepiness and obesity or hypertension. And it ranges from 0 to 3, where 0 indicates the lowest risk and 2 to 3 indicate a high risk of developing OAC. And it has got a sensitivity of 77% with a specificity of 44%. And this is a questionnaire that is used in primary care. The stop bank questionnaire, which is extensively used in a, a pre-operative setting, it has got eight items. S stands for snoring, T stands for tiredness, O for observed events, P for blood pressure, B for BMI, A for age, and N for neck, and G for gender. And it ranges from 0 to 8, and 0 indicates the lowest risk of developing OS. This is the test which has got a highest sensitivity of almost 90%, but however, it is more extensively evaluated in a preoperative system. And next, we have the commonly used one, which is the Epsworth uh, sleepiness scale. It is a self-administered assessment of sleep tendency in eight common situations. And the range and the questionnaire um, scoring ranges from 0 to 24, where 0 indicates the least sleepy and greater than 10 indicates excessive daytime symptoms. And this is a, a questionnaire which has got a highest specificity of 62%. And this is mainly used for assessing sleepiness and response of sleepiness to therapy. And however, it cannot be used like a Berlin questionnaire for a screening for OS. So every questionnaire has its own set of advantages and disadvantages and combinate, uh, combining the scores of the questionnaire may give a higher uh, positive and a negative predictive value for identifying whether the patient is having a uh, pretest probability of an OSA or not. And after examining the symptoms and examining uh, and uh, have having the questionnaire uh, getting evaluated, the next important thing in the assessment of a patient with an OSA is the physical examination. Always look for signs of obesity, look for signs of nasal obstruction, micrognathia or retrognathia, tonsillar hypertrophy, uvular hypertrophy, hypothyroidism, features of acromegaly, macroglossia, tissue edema or fibrosis, and even other craniofacial abnormalities like high arch palate. So assessment of all these things will give you a clue that probably you're dealing with a case of an obstructive sleep apnea in a patient with unexplained symptoms of fatigue or excessive daytime sleepiness or unrefreshing sleep. And these also play an important because this correction of these anatomical abnormalities may play a crucial role in managing these patients with obstructive sleep apnea. In addition to this, a, a clinic uh, uh, procedure which you can simply do at your uh, bedside or in your bench side is assess assessing the patients with the modified Mullenpanty classification or the Friedman's classification to find out uh, what is the level of the uh, whether there is a level of an obstruction at the retropalatal region. So in modified Mullenpanty classification we have got class one to four and in the Friedman's we have class one to four but two has class two has two A and two B. So having assessed your patient, when do you really need to subject this test, subject these patients for a sleep, uh, for a polysomnography or for otherwise a home-based uh, sleep uh, evaluation? So you will subject any patient with unexplained uh, excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue or unrefreshing sleep or sleep trip. If your patient presents to you with an unexplained nocturia, nocturnal GRD, early morning headache or frequent nocturnal awakenings, particularly in the setting of a snoring or a witnessed nocturnal apnea or overbody habitus, 
then probably these patients have to be tested for underlying OSA using a sleep study. And in asymptomatic patients, the US Preventive Service Task Force does not recommend routine screening of asymptomatic patients. But however, screening of asymptomatic patients may become appropriate in occupations that involves excessive risk like driving or in patients with a resistant hypertension. So the in moving on to the diagnostic test for OSA, the standard diagnostic test is a laboratory-based polysomnography. And in laboratory-based polysomnography, we have various components like an airflow measurement, through which through the nose using a nasal cannula and which is connected to a pressure transducer. Or you can measure the airflow measurement using, through the nose and the mouth using a thermal sense. And you can measure the respiratory effort using a thoracic and abdominal inductance bands. And you need to measure the oxygen hemoglobin saturation with the finger pulse oximetry. And snoring is measured using a microphone affixed over your trachea or by filtering out low frequency signals from the nasal cannula pressure transducer system. And in addition, you will also evaluate for the sleep stage and arousal using an EEG, EOG and a chin EMG. In addition, you will use an electrocardiography or a body position or a, uh, uh, and a leg movement has to be evaluated when you are doing an in-lap polysomnography. This is how your epoch for a, a patient with an uh, obstructive sleep apnea looks like. If you see in the EEG, there are a lot of cortical arousals. And these cortical arousals correlate with fall in the saturation, where you can see the saturation dipping from 98 to 83%, and which in turn are associated with an obstructive events in the airflow measurement, and which are together associated with the paradoxical thoracic and the abdominal movement, indicating there is a possibility of an underlying obstructive sleep apnea. And moving on to the home-based testing, this consists of measurements of airflow, respiratory effort, and oxygen saturation, but does not measure uh, movements of uh, sleep or leg movements. So probably this may miss out on a few other things that may contribute to an uh, unrefreshing sleep, like a periodic leg movement. And um, it, it is not the gold standard, and the gold standard always remains an in-lap polysomy. It has got a sensitivity of 79% and a specificity of 79%, which indicates that if you have a high pretest probability of developing an OSA, then probably, and you get a negative result on a home-based testing, then you should subject these patients for an in-lab polysomnography because the sensitivity of this procedure is only 79%. And so in 21% of patients, you may still miss, a, miss out on a diagnosis of an OSA. In patients with unexplained sleepiness and a high clinical suspicion of OSA, a negative home study result should be followed by an in-lab polysomnography to exclude OSA and to evaluate for alternative causes of sleepiness like periodic leg movement symptoms. And in patients with a high pretest probability, 25 to 50 percentage of your home-based tests have come negative and these are proven to be false. So if your home-based testing for sleep disorder comes positive, it can confirm but if it comes negative in a patient with a high pretest probability of OSA, then you need to subject these patients for an in-lab polysomnography. So just to brief up what we have discussed till now, we have a polysomnography, which is the gold standard, and it is a criteria standard for diagnosis of OSA, permits diagnosis of sleep disorders other than OSA as well. But however, the disadvantages, cost and logistic issue. And when we move on to the home-based sleep assessment, it is associated with a lower cost, and it is a greater convenience in compared to the polysomnography. But however, false negative results are possible. Though it can be used as a uh, screening tool, it cannot be used as a uh, tool to exclude a diagnosis of OS. In addition to this, few centers use oximetry, which is just the recording of the blood oxygen saturation during sleep. This can doc the only advantage is it can document a resolution of hypoxemia with the treatment of OSA, but it cannot be used for a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. In addition to this, uh, there are latest advancements which are coming in the diagnostics of um, obstructive sleep apnea. This is a uh, this is a subject that is still under research, which is a non-contact diagnosis of an obstructive sleep apnea using an impulse radio wave wi wide band uh, radio meter. So what it does is like uh, there is a totally a non-contact and there is a impulse radio ultra wide band um, radiation which then helps which then sends the signals to the computer which then processes these signals and finally gives you the diagnosis whether the patient is having an underlying obstructive event or not. 
the non contact respiratory monitoring using the ir uvb radar accurately and reliably measures respiratory events during sleep therefore ir uwb radar may be useful as a respiratory monitoring tool that can overcome the difficulties of conventional psd requiring physical contact with patient and this will make more sense if it comes to the reality given the pandemic of covid where there are a lot of chances that if you don't follow the stringent protocols there may be a transmission of uh, covid infection occurring in a institutional setting or even with the use of this device as well and moving on to the treatment the the treatment can be in the form of a behavioral measures abstinence from alcoholism must and try to avoid sleeping in a supine posture regular aerobic exercise are must for weight reduction and weight loss greater the weight loss is associated with greater benefit and if you see a patient with a positional osa then restricting the sleep to one side or proning may be a sufficient treatment the classical treatment modality for osa which is a positive airway pressure it is a primary therapy for individuals with an symptomatic osa of any severity though in mild you can still try surgery and other behavioral measures the pap normalizes ahi in more than 90% of the patients while wearing the device and one of the most problematic issues with the pap therapy is the adherence so when do we really call it as an adequate adherence it is defined as the use for at least 4 hours per night for at least 5 nights per week if it is that we consider the patient is to be adherent on pap therapy so in case if your patient is not uh, using your pap therapy as expected by him to improve the pap adherence you need to educate these patients monitoring of pap use with reinforcement support for technical problems and behavioral interventions in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational enhancement therapy has to be used and um, there are various techniques to monitor uh, the pap adherence these days, uh, these days we use the clouding devices to monitor whether the patient is uh, uh, adherent to the pap therapy or not these transmit data adherence uh, via cellular network for remote viewing and auto pap these may not be appropriate for individuals in which central sleep apnea is common like when you have a patient with a heart failure or nocturnal hypoxemia for other reasons other than sleep apnea then probably a manual titration of a cpap might be more beneficial than your apap and a few patients may require the use of the bilevel pap devices in certain conditions which are characterized by hypoventilation but however in a routine management of osa patient they are neither more effective nor better tolerated than fixed pressure or apap devices and uh, we have few oral devices in the form of a mandibular repositioning devices these are effective treatment options particularly for patients with a mild to moderate osa it consists of plates made to fit the upper and the lower teeth the positions of these plates can be adjusted allowing advancement of the mandible relative to the maxilla resulting in increased upper airway volume and reduced collapse they were associated with a mean reduction of ahi of 13.6 events per day. so these may be tried in patients with a mild disease or in patients who are refractory to treatment with pap devices surgical modification of the upper airway it is often recommended for symptomatic patients unable to tolerate the pap therapy and the uvulopalatopharyngoplasty has been something which has been extensively researched upon and it involves the resection of the uvula and a part of the soft palate there is lateral wall pharyngoplasty tongue reduction procedures and even maxillomandibular advancement procedure but this forms a very small subset of the population who may benefit from the surgical modification of the upper airway in addition to this we have few devices that are coming up for the management of the mild uh, osa so one such uh, modification which has been uh, one such treatment modality which has been approved by the fda in the recent times is the hypoglossal nerve stimulation so it consists of a unilateral placement of the electrode on the medial branch of the hypoglossal nerve which enhances your tongue protrusion and in turn there is a pressure transducer which is placed between the internal and the external intercostal muscle to detect an inspiratory effort and a small neurostimulator is implanted into the chest wall that triggers the hypoglossal electrode in response to the respiratory effort so here is a uh, pressure transducer which is placed between the internal and the external intercostal so whenever a chest moves this detects the pressure and this detects this sends a sig- signal to the hypoglossal medial branch of the hypoglossal nerve and in turn it triggers them uh, and in turn when a respiratory effort is sensed by this electrode the triggering of the medial branch of the hypoglossal nerve takes place so there is a sensing lead and there is a 
neuro stimulator and there is a stimulating lead which stimulates the hypoglossal uh, nerve thereby preventing the collapse of the upper head there is a trial which is called as the star trial which is stimulation therapy for apnea reduction using these hypoglossal nerve stimulation techniques and this caused the reduction reduced mean ahi median ahi from 29.3 to 9 even square hour and these benefits were sustained even after 5 years of therapy but however the inclusion criteria was stringent only patient with an ahi of 20 to 50 even square hour were included and bmi was less than or equal to 30 so in the exclusion criteria patients who had central sleep apnea were excluded so probably these devices may not be effective for patient with a central sleep apnea for a patient with a positional osa or patient with severe cardio pulmonary or neuromuscular diseases or a complete concentric collapse of the upper airway on drug induced sleep endoscopy so these devices are helpful but you need to proper pro, uh, properly identify the subset of the population who will benefit by, by treatment with hypoglossal nerve stimulation techniques so just to sum up the treatment modalities we spoke about the weight loss which is essential for almost all patients who have an underlying diagnosis of an obstructive sleep apnea aerobic exercises are to be encouraged sleep position restriction to be encouraged and in medical devices we have the pap therapy which is almost the treatment modality of choice for most of the patients with osc but ensuring the adherence to pap therapy is of utmost importance and most of the research activities these days they revolve around the uh, uh, ensuring the adherence either in the form of an education or in a cognitive behavioral therapy or using cloud devices to monitor the adherence and the mandibular repositioning devices as we have seen have a lower efficiency than pap in most patients but however it can be useful for a subsegment of patients who are not adherent to the pap therapy but however the problem is it may cause a temporomandibular joint discomfort and occlusion abnormalities due to the tooth movement in surgical procedures we have spoke about uvulo palato pharyngoplasty it has got a lower efficiency than the pap but one problem of doing such surgeries is that you may cause a velopharyngeal insufficiency and when the weight increases there are chances of high chances of relapse apart from that uh, we spoke about the maxillomandibular advancements which are complex surgeries uh, with recovery time taking almost 2 to 10 weeks and these are indicated only in a subset of population when nothing works your tracheostomy is the last alternative but it may be unacceptable because of the cosmetic result and the effect on the speech but when everything fails and the patient is non adherent to your pap therapy and in a life saving condition your tracheostomy would be a treatment of choice and hypoglossal nerve stimulation techniques which are the recently fda approved modality for the treatment of a selected group of patients in patients who had a bmi less than 32 and absence of concentric collapse of the retropalatal airway on drug induced sleep and disorder. but however it may cause a temporary tongue weakness and tongue soreness and discomfort during stimulation thank you so to have our uh, next talk we have professor danny eckert uh, from australia to introduce our next speaker we have professor vinay kumar he is a professor in hod department of pulmonary medicine thames and he is a consultant pulmonologist at surya chest hospital in karin nagar who has got special interest in management of complex uh, sleep disorder patients over to you sir for the introduction of your next speaker thank you good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce professor danny eckert uh, this evening he is going to speak on phenotyping of osa and its implications for treatment uh, professor danny eckert is from adelaide institute of sleep health flinders health and medical research institute flinders university australia he is a very good speaker and very good uh, known a renowned uh, uh, practitioner in sleep medicine uh, let's how is uh, speak Thank you. Thank you. Well, many thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about today is these different phenotypic causes of sleep apnea and the implications for treatment. So the outline of my presentation is as follows: I'm going to talk about the four key pathophysiological traits that cause sleep apnea uh, using this detailed respiratory phenotyping technique. and the palm scale uh, which I'll also talk about and then I'll talk about the implications for targeted therapy and finally I'll just share a few uh, points on how we can translate this information into the clinic we now know that there's at least four key causes uh, of sleep apnea uh, impaired upper airway anatomy 
waking up too easily from sleep or what's known as a low arousal threshold, uh, being too sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide or having uh, unstable respiratory control, high loop gain or um, poor muscle response an inability to recruit the pharyngeal dilator muscles when the airway is challenged during sleep. Uh, in essence, if we, uh, if we look at this next slide, uh, it's, uh, sleep apnea is essentially uh, an interaction between upper airway dilator anatomy uh, and the presence or absence of these uh, 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 impaired other traits, which I'll describe in a moment. So what you can see in this slide here is if you look on the left hand side, there's a nice patent upper, upper airway and on the right hand side, uh, in the absence of a, um, if you look at this static image in MRI, you can see that it's a narrow crowded upper airway and you may suspect this person would have sleep apnea. However, if you look at the dynamic imaging uh, developed by my colleagues in Sydney, uh, Lynn Bilston and her team, uh, you can actually see that the, despite having a very narrow upper airway, this person uh, does not have sleep apnea because they have fantastic pharyngeal dilator uh, muscle responsiveness. So that protects them from having sleep apnea. Others have uh, uh, a pattern that looks more like this, where the airway is uh, moving uh, in a counterproductive motion. So there's initially some anterior motion at the base of the tongue. Uh, and uh, you can see in this image that the, uh, um, the uh, pharyngeal or the uvula, in fact, is flapping back against the, the posterior pharyngeal wall. So some anterior motion, but the, the, the activity is actually counterproductive. Here's another example of, of someone who uh, has a very crowded airway uh, and in fact does not have sleep apnea. Uh, uh, sorry, has very severe sleep apnea because their airway uh, dilator muscles are not moving at all. Okay, so I'm just going to spend a few moments now to run through uh, how we came up with these four different key causes of sleep apnea. Uh, and there were, it was a quite a detailed protocol that required participants to come in and, and be instrumented with uh, a range of equipment uh, as shown in this image here. So they had intramuscular electrodes into the genioglossus muscle here. Uh, difficult to see, but they're about the width of a hair uh, and taped to the sides of the mouth here. They just come out the sides of the mouth. They've got an epiglottic pressure sensor to measure uh, pressure in the back of the throat, nasal mask, pneumatacograph to measure uh, airflow uh, and respiratory parameters and standard sleep staging. Uh, and arousal scoring uh, uh, equipment. So here's a bit of a close up of the uh, those fine wire electrodes that go into the uh, pharyngeal dilator muscles uh, as shown here. Uh, and we typically measure either from the tensor palatini uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the roof of the mouth here, uh, as well as the, the largest upper airway dilator muscle in the, uh, the genia glossus. Okay, so in the next few slides, I'm just gonna talk through uh, how we measure these these four key uh, causes of, of, of sleep apnea or phenotypes. Uh, everyone is studied on a uh, on therapeutic CPAP uh, as, as shown on the mass pressure channel here. Uh, and in this case, it's actually a healthy individual. We've got them on about five centimeters of water. And then we can see after a few breaths, we've done a transient reduction in the uh, in the airflow as shown here. Uh, and we do this with a modified CPAP machine. So we can deliver up to plus or, or, or uh, plus 20 to uh, minus 20 centimeters of water at the flick of a switch. Uh, and what this allows us to do is induce hypopneas and apneas in a very controlled manner. Uh, and so the first trait we look at is our upper airway collapsibility or, or PCRIT. That is our gold standard for measuring the anatomical compromise of the upper airway. Uh, and we do this by looking at those first few breaths, breaths three to five, immediately following the, uh, the transient reduction in, uh, in, in mask pressure. Uh, and when that induces airflow limitation, we then look at the relationship between uh, uh, mask pressure, uh, as shown on the x-axis in this slide, versus the peak inspiratory flow. So we do these drops a number of times throughout the night to different airway pressures and ideally until we close off the airway. And that is in fact, uh, we look at the regression then and where it intersects with zero 
uh, and that is that individual's peak rate or, or collapsibility. And in the example shown on this slide here, we've got uh, the person in the green triangle, they've got a, a, a relatively mildly collapsible upper airway. Their airway is collapsing at uh, about minus four centimetres of water, so negative suction pressure to close off the airway. This next individual in the blue dots has uh, atmospheric pressure or, or near atmospheric pressure, their airway is closing. Uh, and the person in the red, red uh, uh, data is actually someone who's got a very collapsible airway and their, their airway is closing at or near five centimetres of water. And this is what we see in the sleep apnea population. Some have only a mild degree of anatomical impairment, whereas others have very, you know, very severe uh, uh, collapsible airways and everything in between. Now, the next trait that we're interested in is how well the pharyngeal dilator muscles respond uh, to that challenge or that their hypopnea or apnea. Now, during sleep, it often takes longer for the pharyngeal dilator muscles to be activated than it would uh, awake. And some people, in fact, can only activate their muscles uh, when they wake up. But most patients will get, get at least some uh, upper airway muscle responsiveness uh, to these increasing negative epiglottic pressure swings. And this is what's stimulating the pharyngeal dilator muscles. It's the negative pressure in the back of the throat via reflex driven mechanisms, as well as that build up in CO2 and, and uh, hypoxia over time. So the way we quantify this trait is by, um, we've got the GGEMG, which is the Gini Glossus uh, EMG recording of those uh, fine wire electrodes into the, into the base of the tongue there. And we've got a rectified moving time average signal here. And what we do to quantify this trait is we look at every breath um, during these transient reductions and we plot the relationship between epiglottic pressure and the peak EMG activity on a breath by breath basis. And what you can see in this uh, image here, this is both tensor palatini and genioglossus muscle activation in response to a single drop. And you can see here that um, with this brief uh, reduction in the CPAP pressure, uh, there's almost a, an immediate airway closure with no airflow on the bottom tracing. Uh, but look what happens within uh, two or three breaths, uh, they can recruit their muscles very strongly but good reflex uh, activation, and this protects them from having uh, a prolonged uh, disruption to their breathing uh, because they, they're able to activate their pharyngeal dilator muscles very well, much like that initial image that I showed in the, uh, in the MRI and that first uh, tracing. The opposite extreme is, is what we also see in some individuals. So we do a, a drop where we induce airflow limitation, uh, we're generating negative epiglottic pressure swings, yet there is no quantifiable activation of the pharyngeal dilator muscles. So this is someone with very poor muscle responsiveness during sleep. And here's what those two examples look like when we quantify all the drops. So every, every dot represents a single breath throughout the night. Uh, usually we'll do 20 or 30 of these uh, transient reductions in pressure throughout the night. We plot every breath. Blue one is the first example where we can see excellent muscle responsiveness uh, to changes in airway pressure, whereas the second one is that flat line, so a, a very a flat slope, really no activation of the muscles until they have an arousal from sleep. Okay, the next trait uh, that contributes to sleep apnea pathogenesis is how easily you wake up to these uh, negative uh, uh, pressure swings or how much effort you uh, generate to breathe uh, during a hypopnea or apnea. And we quantify this as the nadir, either epiglottic pressure or esophageal pressure, immediately prior to a brief arousal from sleep during a respiratory event. Again, we do this a number of times and we take the average value as that individual's respiratory arousal threshold. And the final trait is, is measuring uh, ventilator responses to these brief reductions in airflow or, or a concept that we uh, refer to as loop gain. And here it is displayed schematically here. So we've, we've delivered one of these transient drops in the CPAP pressure and that's, that's lowered minute ventilation. And so we've induced a respiratory disturbance. Uh, and, and in this case, it's a, a, a minus 2.3 liter reduction in minute ventilation. Uh, and then what we do is we um, uh, reopen the airway with a uh, 
by reintroducing the set therapeutic CPAP and we measure the ventilated response to that ventilator disturbance. In this case, it was 4.2 liters. And so the loop gain is simply the ratio of uh, disturbance to, to the ventilator response. In this case, it would be a number close to two, which is actually quite a, quite a stable number. Okay. So this is, this is what we see in this, in this uh, detailed phenotype study that we did uh, in Boston. Green dots represent people without sleep apnea as measured by the AHI on the, uh, on the x-axis. And the red dots are people with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And we've got to, uh, several groupings here. So people who have a P-crit, that's the, the collapsibility of the airway, less than minus five centimeters of water, as shown by that circle, do not have sleep apnea. Their airway is, is non-collapsible, so it doesn't matter if their muscles aren't working very well or even if they've got a low arousal threshold or high lip gain, they will not get sleep apnea because their airway is non-collapsible. The other extreme is these people up here with, with very collapsible upper airways, their P-crit, so their airway is closing off at plus five centimetres of water or higher, and you can see invariably these people have very severe sleep apnea, 40 events or more per hour of sleep. But you can also see that there's uh, overlap between these people without sleep apnea, um, people with mild sleep apnea, moderate, uh, and in fact, severe sleep apnea for the same level of anatomical compromise. So this, uh, as shown in this box here, these people have got identical uh, anatomical compromise. Uh, so it must be those non-anatomical causes, things like the muscles not working very well, being too sensitive to CO2, and waking up too easily that's driving their sleep apnea. So for these people, non-anatomical interventions is what you, uh, should be able to get them back to normality or, or, or uh, resolve their sleep apnea. So targeted interventions for, and it's about 20% of people with sleep apnea, uh, this is their predominant issue. It's those, those other non-anatomical factors. So things that we could do to shift that to the left would, would uh, theoretically solve their sleep apnea. Others, if you look up the, at this top group up here uh, with people with uh, very severe sleep apnea, just uh, changing the non-anatomical traits might move them a little bit towards the left, um, but because their anatomy is so impaired, they're going to need a combination of anatomical and non-anatomical therapies or something like CPAP that uh, resolves the uh, problems regardless of the causes of sleep apnea. That is, it acts downstream from the underlying causes of the disease. So if we look back to that original schematic that I, that I showed at the start, showing the four different causes of sleep apnea, from this study, what we see is that yes, everyone with sleep apnea has some degree of anatomical vulnerability or compromise, but the magnitude varies between minus five to plus five centimeters and above. About a third of patients wake up too easily or have what's called a low arousal threshold. A third have unstable control of breathing or high loop gain and a third are unable to uh, recruit their pharyngeal muscles during sleep to, uh, to open the airway. And overall, 70% of people with sleep apnea have one or more of these non-anatomical factors that contributes to their sleep apnea. And this uh, uh, has led to this concept, the palm scale, so the P-crit, arousal threshold, loop gain, and muscle responsiveness scale to help us understand these various causes and uh, ultimately deliver targeted therapy. So what I've done here in, in, in developing this scale is um, just show you uh, according to the breakdown as, as uh, firstly from the P-crit, so how collapsible their airway is. So people that have a P-crit where their airway is collapsing over um, two centimeters of water, so it's severe anatomical impairment, it's about 20, 25% of patients have that problem. Most patients fall into this palm scale category two, where it's a moderate degree of anatomical impairment. So their airway is collapsing at about atmospheric pressure. And a minority of patients, about 20%, have the same level of anatomical compromise as people without sleep apnea. And you can see over here, if you look at the non-anatomical breakdown for those people, 100% of them have a non-anatomical feature that's, that's driving their sleep apnea. Whereas in the other two groups, it's about 60%. 
So ultimately what we're trying to do by understanding if we had a simple way of, of measuring uh, firstly the anatomy and these non-anatomical traits is that we could use these palm scale concepts to deliver targeted therapy. Uh, I've alluded to that a little bit already. So if we look at, if we take these people on the, on the left-hand side that have uh, just a mild degree of anatomical impairment, we should be able to treat their sleep apnea just using one or more non-anatomical interventions. Whereas people in the red on the other side are gonna need a major anatomical intervention, something like CPAP or, or certainly combination therapy. Uh, and then you've got the two groups in between in blue. Um, some people who have uh, anatomical issues uh, uh, only, uh, so they might need one or more anatomical interventions, perhaps a mandibular advancement split plus some position therapy or CPAP. Whereas others who have a non-anatomical contribution, which is sort of two thirds of that group, uh, might benefit from something like oxygen therapy and uh, a mandibular advancement split, for example. And I'll show you a little bit more about uh, these examples and the work that we've done to now that we've defined these different causes of sleep apnea, you know, what can we do to help all those people who cannot uh, tolerate CPAP therapy, which we know is about half or more of, of people who, uh, who try it. And then, of course, there are others who are uh, unwilling to even, even try the therapy. So here's another way of just summarizing the various uh, causes of sleep apnea, the non-anatomical traits in purple. Uh, and, and as we've understood this, uh, the importance of these non-anatomical traits, they, they open the, uh, the pathway for, for new targeted therapies as I've uh, already alluded to. Uh, whereas most of our existing therapies as shown up here in white actually uh, target the anatomical problem uh, of sleep apnea. So what I'm going to do now is just briefly give an example of each uh, of these components and, uh, and, and on non-CPAP uh, therapies that we can, uh, can, can use to, uh, to change the, uh, uh, each of these traits. So this is a, a detailed study that we did um, in collaboration with Peter Sestouli and uh, a PhD student that we had, uh, Ahmad. And, and these, are, these are very uh, detailed studies that we performed um, uh, in my lab where we uh, took this matrix device uh, and um, instrumented the uh, patients with all the phenotyping equipment including EMG wires, epiglottic pressure sensor and so forth. And what this device allows us to do is remotely move the position of their jaw whilst they're sleeping. So we moved it to three different positions while they're asleep. Baseline, 50% and 100% of maximum advancement range. And this is what we found. Um, so what we're interested in here, in order to deliver uh, non-CPAP treatments, we need to know how much uh, each of these um, interventions or therapies are changing each of the phenotypic traits and how they work. Uh, and so what it would appear from this study is that the, um, the way in which mandibular advancement splints are, are helping people with sleep apnea is they're improving upper airway anatomy. They're making the airway, as shown here of the PCRIT, much less collapsible. But you can see from these individual data, it varies considerably between people. So it will depend on where you start as to how much, uh, whether or not you're going to get a, a full therapeutic benefit from a mandibular advancement splint alone. Uh, and you can see some people have very, very major uh, beneficial uh, uh, changes in, in collapsibility when we go from baseline 50% to 100%, whereas others are, are only changing a little bit in terms of their improvement. But nonetheless, the overall finding was this dose dependent increase in, uh, uh, or improvement I should say, in upper airway collapsibility when you um, had a mandibular advancement split in place. And the table below shows you the uh, 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 the beneficial change. So in fact, when you go from in this group who had on average about two centimeters of water, a collapsible airway, when you move to 100% of their maximal advancement range, you got about a six centimeter of water improvement in their collapsibility. So anyone you can imagine that's got a, a, a peak crit of less than zero, they're gonna have, as long as they're getting that four or five centimeter uh, improvement in collapsibility, their, their sleep apnea you would predict would be resolved. Okay, but we're also interested in this other uh, concept about um, 
perhaps by moving the jaw forward uh, with a mandibular advancement splint, we are also improving the muscle uh, effectiveness or the ability of the genioglossus to, uh, and other dilator muscles to open the airway because you've improved the uh, anatomic arrangement of the muscle fibers. Now, this was a relatively small sample, um, uh, obviously very detailed and complex studies. There was a little bit of a hint perhaps that the muscle responsiveness was getting better uh, when we move the muscles forward, but not uh, significantly so in this uh, initial study. But this is something that we want to follow up and, uh, and, and see if this is uh, actually the case in a larger sample. So it seems that mandibular advancement splints work primarily by improving the collapsibility of the airway, but perhaps there is a little bit of a hint that they may also be improving the muscles a little bit, but let, certainly the main uh, mechanism is by uh, improving upper airway anatomy. Okay, so if we move on to the next trait, I'll just give you an example from uh, some of the work that we've been doing to uh, try and uh, deliver pharmacotherapy or drugs that will uh, improve the muscle responsiveness. Uh, uh, now, the, as sleep apnea is this interaction between anatomy and how well the muscles are responding, it's, it, this is a crucial target for uh, uh, sleep apnea therapies. Now we've seen things like hypoglossal nerve stimulation and you can potentially train the muscles to make them uh, work better. Um, but what we've done here is based on some work out of uh, Richard Horner's lab in Toronto where he showed in animal models that the, uh, the anti-muscarinic anti and also the uh, uh, noradrenergic system is, or the cholinergic system is very important in the control of these pharyngeal dilator muscle tone during sleep. So what uh, Luigi here did in, in a study with uh, uh, collaborators in Boston that uh, Luigi led uh, was to, to look at these two drugs, adamoxetine um, and oxybutynin. So existing drugs to see if, if they would, based on those animal data, if we, could, if we could give these drugs with these properties, can we improve muscle responsiveness? Uh, and in this group of uh, about 20 people with sleep apnea, you can see here in the blue versus placebo, this combination did in fact uh, improve the muscle responsiveness by about three or four fold uh, compared to placebo. And the reductions in sleep apnea severity uh, were also substantial, uh, over 60% um, uh, for the group as a whole. Uh, and with many people now being in the uh, uh, treated range uh, with this drug combination, just a single night in this initial proof of uh, concept intervention. And you can see in this study benefits were uh, occurred both during non-REM and REM sleep. So this, um, we, uh, that, as I mentioned, that study was conducted in, in Boston. Um, Richard Lim in my lab in, uh, in Sydney at the time was also looking at other agents with these properties, uh, so anti-muscarinics and uh, uh, cholinergic agents. And we looked at these two different agents, raboxetine and, and butyl bromide uh, in healthy individuals. And what he found, what Richard found in this study was that indeed when, when we gave this combination of drug versus placebo, that tensor palatini muscle, the one at the, uh, at the top of the mouth, the, the, uh, the purple one shown in the schematic here, uh, actually had high levels of activity uh, during uh, stage two and, and, and uh, stage three sleep. So in, uh, the upper airway anatomy, uh, function improved, I should say, that it was decreased upper airway resistance uh, in, in this study as well. Um, we've since gone on to uh, do some of those studies in people with sleep apnea and also shown uh, some, some benefit. Okay, so what about, um, what, are, what can we do for these people who are light sleepers um, uh, or people that have this low respiratory arousal threshold, the ones that wake up too easily? So if they're waking up too easily all the time, they don't have enough time to actually recruit the pharyngeal dilator muscles themselves or get into deeper stage three sleep, which we know is, is better from a breathing point of view. So uh, sleep apnea tends to be much less severe in, in, in slow wave sleep. Uh, and yeah, if you're waking up all the time, you, uh, you're you also having big breaths and, and, and having trouble with your respiratory control as you blow off your CO2. So the first uh, attempt we, we made at this was, was a study I did when I was in Boston where we gave the drug Ezopiclone. 
uh, one of the ZEG drugs. And what we're able to show that indeed giving this drug um, in this small randomized trial, we were able to increase the arousal threshold by about 30%. So three or four centimeters of water improvement in their uh, arousal threshold. And when we broke it down to people with moderate uh, versus low arousal thresholds, the people who were the light sleepers tended to have about a 45% reduction in their uh, sleep apnea severity, whereas those with moderate uh, arousal thresholds or high arousal thresholds didn't have any systematic change. Now, we didn't study people who had low oxygen to begin with in these studies because that could um, potentially make their oxygenation worse. Um, but what it did show is, you know, this proof of concept that if you can stabilize sleep with a, a hypnotic in these people who wake up too easily, uh, you can actually um, uh, improve their uh, uh, breathing stability. We've done a, a series of studies uh, since the, that, that initial finding. Uh, and here's one I just want to highlight that uh, uh, Jane Carberry did in, in my lab. Um, very detailed studies where she looked at a range of different looked at um, temazepam, zolpidem, and zopaclone. And what she found in this particular study, to our surprise, was zolpidem actually not only did it increase the arousal threshold, uh, which would be beneficial for those light sleepers, but it also, because uh, we're very conscious, we didn't want, um, it's not, not useful to give these drugs if they're going to relax the upper airway dilator muscles, as some GABAergic agents may. Um, but what we found was the opposite. Actually, with zolpidem here in this particular study, in these 20 or so people with and without sleep apnea, the muscle acti uh, responsiveness got two or three times better uh, on drug than off. So that's something that we've, uh, we're have we also following up on. Uh, Jane did an initial pilot study without the CPAP in these people and showed that it was um, beneficial in the order of about a 10% increase in sleep efficiency. Um, uh, no systematic change in the AHI in these unselected people, um, but you may um, uh, uh, think that this might be useful in people who have insomnia and, and sleep apnea, uh, and in that they can get them into, into um, uh, improve their sleep efficiency, and it may have uh, next day beneficial effects. Uh, obviously, that requires further investigation, and that's something that we and others are. Uh, following up on but certainly all the studies that we've done as long as you don't take people with um, very severe oxygenation problems so very hypoxemic to begin with if you target these low arousal threshold people uh, it seems that most common sleeping pills at, st at standard doses do not uh, worsen sleep apnea you know, severity and some people can actually improve okay um, and just the last few um, points are, you know, in other disease states, we we treat um, the condition. We know that the causes of sleep apnea, as I've highlighted, are multifactorial. Um, and if, if we take other disease states, let's say uh, asthma, for example, we, we use drugs that are not only open up the airway in terms of bronchodilation, but we also uh, combine them with drugs that have anti-inflammatory properties to target two of the mechanisms. So far, we don't do that in sleep apnea, but there's no reason why we shouldn't. Uh, deliver therapies that would target, you know, multiple causes of this disease. So here's a study that Brad Edwards did when he was in Boston, uh, where he gave uh, ezopiclone to increase the arousal threshold, plus some oxygen to lower the loop gain or unstable respiratory control. And these were just unselected people. And you can see with these two non-anatomical interventions, the benefit that was uh, that occurred in terms of the AHI. Uh, with many people actually uh, falling into the treated range just by giving those two non-anatomical interventions. Here's some other work that uh, we've been doing where we're combining a, um, a novel mandibular advancement splint with some EPAP valves or, or similar to the ProVent concept. Um, because if you take people uh, who are prescribed a mandibular advancement splint, we know that roughly half of them will not have a full therapeutic response, and we don't know how to predict who those people are very well at the moment. So what we did in this study is we took the people who didn't respond to this novel therapy. Uh, so if you look at the mass only condition on the bottom versus no mass, you can see that they've still got about 20 events per hour. But then when we added a little bit of an expiratory valve to make to build up some expiratory pressure upon exhalation over the uh, this oral vent of the uh, this novel device, we were able to get um, 
significant improvements in their sleep apnea severity. And then when we added uh, an additional event over the nose as well, we got even further benefit. So there's an example of two anatomical interventions, relatively simple to add to a, a mass device that, uh, that helped uh, in those individuals, or in, at least in many of them. Uh, and, and there is now, these are now commercially available products um, uh, as shown in, the, uh, the, uh, uh, in these figures that resulted uh, uh, from this work. Okay, so we now have a, a range of, uh, at least in, in the research setting, uh, are a variety of options that can potentially uh, deliver benefit uh, in terms of targeted therapies. So we have our existing therapies in, shown in this cartoon, things such as weight loss will help improve the anatomy or the collapsibility of the airway, upper airway surgery, certainly CPAP, and different advancement splints. But we're now starting to learn about some of these non-anatomical interventions, hyperglossal nerve therapy, some of the drugs that I showed you that are showing promise, can train the muscles, drugs to increase arousal threshold, oxygen to lower loop gain, and there's also some medications that can help with that as well, potentially. So that's where we're trying to move towards, uh, where we can uh, deliver these targeted therapies. So rather than making clinical decisions based on a, a, a single frequency measure, the AHI, which we know doesn't particularly track very well with patient outcomes, whether it be cardiovascular or how they're feeling in terms of their sleepiness, if we had some information on their phenotypes, or so how collapsible their airway was, and, and these non-anatomical as shown in the green uh, 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 pathway below, then this uh, could uh, potentially uh, deliver a precision medicine approach where uh, the patient gets the right treatment uh, earlier on and does not have to go through this trial and error uh, process. Uh, so that's certainly what we're working towards, but in order to do that, we need to be able to deliver some simplified tools that we can use in the clinic to translate, to measure each of these traits accurately. Because uh, as I showed you, those uh, very detailed physiology studies are certainly not feasible in the, in the clinical setting. So in that regard, I'm just going to give you one example that we've, we've done recently. So this is uh, Amal Osman, who's a, a postdoc in my lab um, in Adelaide. Um, she did her PhD on this topic and was very much looking for simplified ways to measure PCREC. And all she did in this study was uh, during a standard CPAP titration study, she turned off the CPAP machine for five to 10 breaths at a time with the concept being that people that had an airflow response uh, in, in relation to those drops, they're, they're much more likely to have a, um, a non-collapsible airway compared to those who had no airflow whatsoever. So it's a very simplified way of getting the, the P crit simply by turning the CPAP off. And you can see here from these plots that indeed that was the case. There was a relationship between uh, the P crit, which Amal measured on a separate night, uh, compared to that simple uh, turning off the CPAP machine and here we've got the sensitivity and one over specificity curves or the receiver operating characteristics. And we can see that, um, you know, this, this worked very, you know, very well um, with uh, in, in determining people with um, a, either a subatmospheric P crit or uh, those with uh, less than minus two. And there are the area under the curve uh, data as shown there. So that's one example. There are others that my colleagues in Boston and elsewhere are using with signal processing techniques so that ideally, hopefully from a standard diagnostic sleep test, if we do a few little things differently, we can actually get a report that would tell us about all the traits to help us uh, with those uh, clinical decisions. Okay, so I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there, but I, I'll just finish by thanking my uh, my team of collaborators at the Adelaide Institute for Sleep Health, uh, as shown here, uh, and happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Professor Urquhart, for an excellent uh, uh, talk. Uh, there are a few questions uh, with related to phenotyping on uh, uh, OSA. Like, is phenotyping should be done for every patient, or what will be the selection criteria, like only when the patient doesn't improve? or you find the patient is non-compliant, when do you really choose a patient to phenotype a patient or it should be universal for all the patients? It, it's a good question. Um, certainly we know that many patients will benefit from, from CPAP and um, 
and and they can be streamlined and um, what phenotype and perhaps you know phenotyping does not have a, a beneficial role to, to play in those individuals but still we're not very good at picking who who those people are yes they tend to be the ones who are sleepiest uh, and most severe but where phenotyping can help is in all those scenarios that you just raised so yeah perhaps it's someone who's already tried CPAP and they've failed and they're looking for an alternate intervention what, what I would like to see ultimately is that when a patient comes to the clinic, we will be able to uh, very easily from either from their sleep study recordings um, using some signal processing techniques, or perhaps we, we do things slightly differently and, and perhaps turn off the CPAP every now and then, as I showed in the example from a male, male's data, we could then have a prediction that would come out and say, okay, for this particular patient, based on their physiology, we think that you've got an 80% chance of responding to CPAP, or this person might need a mandibular advancement splint plus a medication, and that'll give us a 90% chance of success. So that's ultimately where, um, you know, I would like to see it heading at, and, um, but that requires some further work to, to bring those tools to fruition and also to show that these therapies, these non-CPAP therapies, uh, these newer ones that are emerging are safe and efficacious in the long term, which we, we don't yet know. And uh, another question uh, to this is like, how uh, practical and uh, uh, effective will it, uh, will putting these electrodes in the uh, genioglossus EMG and in the epiglottis uh, to find out the level of obstruction and functional MRI. All these things like how practical uh, will it be in a routine clinical practice or is it still only in the research level that we uh, limit ourselves to phenotyping the uh, OSA? Yes, yeah, so certainly those detailed phenotyping measurements are not practical uh, in clinical practice and they never will be. Um, and so our, our task is, is to really develop those accurate uh, surrogate measures of, of each of the traits. And um, we already have some of those. So we can predict with a high degree of accuracy, the arousal threshold from three standard parameters from a sleep study, the AHI, the fraction of apneas to hypopneas, and the uh, saturation, the nadir saturation. So from those parameters alone, we can get a you know, reasonable, you know, with 80% accuracy or higher uh, to know who's gonna have a low arousal threshold. So that's, that has to be the way forward where um, we just use, basically we, we make better use of the detailed information that we're already collecting during sleep studies. Um, there's lots of rich neurophysiological information uh, that, that extends way beyond the AHI. Um, so I think if we, we use that information more, more carefully um, and, and we can get you know, quite accurate estimates of each of these traits so that we can use that to then inform these targeted therapy decisions. Okay, and uh, last question, sir. Uh, like, if at all, given the uh, current evidence what we have and uh, given the current facilities in a routine clinical practice uh, we have for phenotyping of OSA, what will be your standard approach to a patient uh, who is non-compliant on a CPAP, who has got a severe OSA, and you still want to uh, try all these devices in this patient, like what will be your algorithmic approach if there is any, like given the uh, barriers and routine implementation of this phenotyping practices? Yeah, look, good, good question. And ultimately, if we could only learn about one of the traits, um, we would want to know about the collapsibility because that's, that, you know, sleep apnea is still largely a anatomical problem. So if we knew where their baseline collapsibility is, then that was, would, and, and we know how much these other non-CPAP therapies can shift uh, that collapsibility, um, that might give us greater confidence to then, um, you know, prescribe a mandibular advancement splint or perhaps a splint with some positional therapy. Because from the data that I showed in the presentation, on average, you can get about a five, six centimeter of water improvement in your collapsibility with a mass or with a mandibular advancement split. And it's about two or three centimeters for a position therapy. Um, so, so if we knew that number, that alone would, would, would help us, you know, head in the right direction. And I think, you know, the, the data that I showed from Amal, where you just simply turn off the CPAP uh, for a few breaths at a time, could could help us uh, inform those decisions in a much more targeted manner than we're all, we're doing at the moment.
thank you sir thank you professor uh, dani ekkar for a excellent uh, uh, talk on phenotyping in osa and giving a broad uh, idea about what it is all about and what where we are currently in the management of osa and uh, thank you once again for uh, accepting our invitation and being a part of this uh, uh, educational program we really appreciate your efforts sir thanks a lot my pleasure and thank you very much for the invitation